Hello, welcome to theCUBE's special presentation. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante for exclusive CUBE coverage with Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon, former CEO of AWS. Andy, great to see you. Thanks for having us in your little den here. You should be doing media hits all week. It's great, great to see to, you. It's great to be with you guys. This is a tradition. We've done this a lot of years Dave, together. I love the fact that you're doing videos and you came on stage. The energy in the room completely changed when Matt introduces the OG, the godfather of cloud, and then the, just the crowd reaction was pretty strong. It was really, you can really feel the energy. And then this just continued, you dropped the, the mega announcement of, of having your own model. But just in general, since then, it's just been a great event. And uh, my first question is, do you miss it? You're back. Oh, it, it's, well, first of all, uh, I thought Matt did an awesome job in the keynote. And uh, um, it's, it's a thrill to be back. I, I, I love reInvent. There's not a week I like better during the year. I'd missed not being here for a few years. I was uh, honored to be back. And you know, one of the things I love about reInvent is that it, it's it, actually the thing I love most about it is the people. You know, yeah. just being around our customers. We work so hard all the time, and we see all the warts and all the things that we think we can be doing better for customers that we want to deliver for them. And we're, you know, you're, you're kind of heads down, and then to be around all your yeah. community partners and your customers and your partners and have them excited. And we hear stories, you know, one of my favorite parts about reInvent every year, and I've heard this at least three times in the last 24 hours, is that people come here to learn from each other mm -hmm. and to learn about what they can be doing differently and to be inspired to go back to their own businesses and change their customer experiences. And you get teams that come mm -hmm. together and they see a bunch of services released or they hear what others are doing and they go to the bar and they say, <laughs> We're doing this. Let's go, and yeah. they go back and they make a change, and that's what this is about. It's trying it to feels help like the levels of on the original uh, reInvent we went to in 2013, our first. So I've been our 12 years, but the vibe feels like the old school reInvent when it was smaller group, but the energy was high. Um, and we're kind of on this AI generation. You can see some of the cards you guys are playing, the infrastructure advancements. But now with the AI, era, I have to ask you: you've operationalized the, the cloud and did all the greatness turn the world on fire, create disruption. Okay, taught people the working backwards documents, you operationalize everything. Now with AI, is that the same plan that you see? Because these builders are going to go faster, they're going to have the AI at their, at their back. What's your, how do you look at this next uh, wave of cloud? Well, I think they're very much connected. You know, I mean, just perspective-wise, I mean, we felt like uh, we grew the AWS business really quickly, and um, it took us about eight or nine years uh, to build an AWS uh, annual run rate of about $4 billion or so. And uh, if you look at AI, that'll happen in just a couple of years. And so it's, it, it's growing incredibly quickly, but the reality is they're very much connected because if you, first of all, if you want to use AI, you have to have your data organized and architected in such a way that you can access it and try doing AI from a mainframe. It's, it's nearly impossible. So you really need to have your infrastructure modernized in the cloud and your data accessible to run AI. And then the reality is that I think, when, you know, you've heard us talk for years about every application is compute, virtually every application is storage, almost every application is database, and analytics, and content. You know, another one of those core building blocks is going to be inference. Every application is going to have some generative AI and inference infused in it. And so it's very much a building block. And, you know, I, I also think that you don't show up and just have one big service that everybody uses that has all the features and presto, people can do it. You have to build the right set of primitives and building blocks that people can stitch together. And that's what we've been doing over the last number of years with SageMaker and with Bedrock and with um, our own chips that we think are going to help people be much more price performant in their training and their inference. And you'll continue to see that from us. When you think about the impact that Amazon has had on the industry broadly, it's pretty remarkable. John mentioned working backwards, customer obsession, two pieces of teams, the flywheel concept, what I call Jassy's Law, there's no compression algorithm for experience. Two questions, has that changed? Is there a compression algorithm for, for experience in this AI era? And are there new sort of operational frameworks that are emerging as a result of this in our opinion? Well, I, I think that, um, the models, for, you know, it's not like people started working on these big transformer models two years ago. People were working on these, a lot of us were working on them for a long time, and the first several versions of the models just weren't that interesting. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, really, OpenAI's GPT-3 
the intelligence level just kind of popped off the chart. And that opened up all sorts of possibilities. And I feel like the first real application that just exploded was ChatGPT. But if you think about ChatGPT, it, 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 it's kind of a pretty thin user interface on top of a model. It's remarkable. And uh, I think one of the things that people don't realize, I was talking about this in the keynote, is to build great generative AI, generative AI applications, it's not fast, actually. You know, we, if you are building, uh, if you're doing a software development project, we can get on a whiteboard and map it out. And of course there are differences, but it largely functions as you design it. Whereas with generative AI apps, it's very iterative. Like you think you're going to make a big advancement in what you've done, and, and then it turns out you don't. You think you're making a, a, a tiny change and it gets much better. And so, you know, it's, it's very iterative. And then it's not just the model. I think people have very often trick themselves with a good model that they think they're, they're there, but they're really only about 70% of the way there. And applications, it don't really work well for users if there's 30% error rates or wonkiness. And so the UI really matters, the fluency, the messaging really matters, the latency really matters, the cost efficiency really matters. So all of these things, it very much applies that there's no compression algorithm for, uh, um, for experience. And what, you know, what we tell a lot of companies, before the pandemic, companies were on this march to modernize their Almost infrastructure, move yeah. from my premises to the cloud. And then the pandemic hit, we got into survival mode, and then the, there was an uncertain economy, and everyone was cost optimizing. And now as people start to spend again, mm -hmm. people are asking us, should we, should we modernize our infrastructure or should we do generative AI? Mm -hmm. And of course the answer is yes, but if you don't take the low hanging fruit of modernizing your infrastructure, you're actually not in a position to take advantage of AI, but you have to pick a few initiatives that really will change your business and get that muscle to build generative AI apps because it's not fast to be great at it. Andy, I want to get your thoughts on the infrastructure side because we've had this question on our queue about building AI clusters, people try to do it on-prem, cloud has advantages. Also on theCUBE, the word blast radius has come up a lot, which is, I know is an Amazon term that James Hamilton and the team uses. It's hard to build large scale infrastructure. Uh, Dave Brown and I talked about that. Talk about the dynamics of the infrastructure at scale because you guys see stuff at scale that others don't. Things do break. Building a system to power the kind of apps that are coming, certainly the devil's going to go crazy with, with Genio, it's certainly bedrock in some of the models, but to run it all, you need the horsepower. Yeah. Well, you know, we, as you know, we've been building very large scale infrastructure and running really the, the largest workloads in the world for a really long time. And, and, you know, I think that when you look at the ultra large training clusters that are being run, uh, they're, they're not simple. You know, they, and uh, uh, when you're running a cluster of a thousand chips, it's very different than when you're running a cluster of a few hundred thousand chips, like we're going to run for Anthropic and their, you know, their future models yeah. of training on us. And, you know, I, I also think that uh, one of the biggest inhibitors, in my opinion, for uh, generative AI applications to be as broad as they're going to be, some of it is, is skill set and experience. Uh, but but a, a good piece of it is the the costs need to keep getting lower. You know, and, and the, um, the cost of uh, the compute in, uh, and the chips in the compute so you can do training much more cost effectively, uh, optimizing inference, which again is the cost yeah. of the compute, but also some efficiencies, and we've done a lot of inventing there. And so we, you know, as, as we are building very large scale generative AI applications inside Amazon, because we're building about a thousand of those apps already, as well as running them for large customers, we're getting really good experience. Even okay. um, if you think about trading, if, if you guys have looked at Hyperpod yeah. in SageMaker, it's a radically different experience in, in what you can do on the networking side. And then if you if you take Hyperpod and you combine that with what we're being, what we're going to be able to do with Trainium with, with ultra servers and ultra clusters, it's just a different level of scale to be able to train your And to models. replicate that is, I mean, from a replication standpoint, I want to try to do that on-prem. I mean, it's I mean, really hard. So I want to ask you uh, about some of the things you're doing at Amazon.com, and I want to talk about the market. You know, we love to talk about the market. So if you look at the market, and you just focus on the big three hyperscalers, maybe throw in Alibaba, I ask and pass. Amazon's got over 50% of the market, and it's maybe a couple hundred billion. John, years ago, when you and I first met in, in New York, wrote a piece of Trillion Dollar Baby. Yeah. So if you add in it's SaaS actually trillion and all the, what John calls fake cloud, um, and, and the professional <laughs> services, it's what well, called it. Yeah, but, but well, on the number standpoint, but you add all that in, yeah. and and it's it's about almost nine hundred billion now. So and it's going to 
it's growing at whatever, 20%. So you undercounted. Well, three clouds when they bundle in there. It's, so getting, here's yeah. my question. So you're doing some really interesting things, and you don't participate really in the SaaS. I think our SaaS business is probably as big as yours. But so, but you actually have things like Connect. I was going to say, doing, Connect's kind yes, of in that yes, category. Yes, so yeah. bigger than ours. So, but you're doing some other really interesting things, applying AI internally, yeah. that you could potentially, and will, I'm sure, point to the external world. Is that how we should think about your up the stack sort of opportunity? Well, you know, I mean, what's interesting, I mean, something like Connect is an example. Uh, it's, it's, it was built from the ground up to be a, a, a call center software um, service that um, was built on the cloud, that was highly scalable, was really cost effective, but also was built from ground up with AI. And if you look, yeah. e if you look even in the last week at the features that Connect just launched, they continue to iterate in a very fast clip. And so um, we, we have a bunch of, I'll say supply chain is another area that we think yep. we can be very effective in. We have a lot of experience just like customer service there. But I also believe that AI is going to open up all sorts of new SaaS opportunities and software and service opportunities. I've been saying this for a long time. I've told you guys this too, which is that I think every single SaaS company and application that we know of will be reinvented with what's available mm -hmm. in the cloud. And I think that's doubly true when you think about yeah. what AI allows. And that's a partner play. Which yeah, you just that's a partner play. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. the mar these market segments are so large. Mm -hmm. I always got a chuckle over the years that we would launch something in some area and people would theorize it was the end for these companies and it just never has happened. They're yeah. really large market segments with lots of winners and sometimes our customers will insist that we have an offering mm -hmm. in a certain area, they really want it, but we also have lots of experience that even when we offer something, a lot of our partners in that same area are very yeah. successful on top of I mean, you, I mean, you guys at Amazon have a great experience with sellers, right? I mean, you guys right. have scale, so to me, as you guys grow, you're in rarefied air, and I think one of the things that's coming out this year is the maturity of Amazon, of services at Amazon, is an econo economic force. So you're seeing things at scale, this is scalable apps, and now with all the horsepower, basically high-performance computing. Yeah. You're seeing new applications emerging, and you once said in theCUBE when I asked you, if you had to build Amazon again, what would you do? And you said serverless. Uh, I think what year that was, but serverless has been popular. And yeah. you mentioned inference. So, Will there be these next level apps that are going to take advantage of the high performance computing that are going to be inference-less or database-less? What do you call it? If serverless is serverless, inference would be database-less or because? I, no, I think you'll still have database. You, databases serve a really yeah. important role even with inference, but I, I mean, I think, uh, I remember that conversation we had where you asked me if we were going to build it over again. I said I would do a serverless yeah. and we were incredulous yeah. about that. <laughs> but I, I think, one of the things that's been really interesting, if you look, we have um, metronomically over the last five years taken all of our analytics services and given people serverless opportunities. And then the same thing on the database side. And we were blown away at how much traction Aurora serverless has gotten in the last few uh -huh. years. And it was a really important part of how we thought about building Aurora at DSQL. And you know, Aurora DSQL is, in many ways, it, I think it's a great AWS and Amazon example of how we think yeah. about building, which was, we were working on this concept when I was still in AWS, which cool. was we knew that customers wanted a multi-region database, a relational database. They wanted strong consistency, they wanted low latency, they wanted high availability, they wanted SQL compatibility, yeah. and they wanted it to be easier to run. And all, there were a couple options out there, but they were really only good at a couple of those things. And all the ideas we had were also only good at two or three of those things. And we kept getting down the road in, in, in the working backwards process and ripping it up because we just felt like we weren't yeah. really solving the problem. And so it forced us to kind of radically rethink how we did, a, you know, Werner went through in his keynote a bunch uh -huh. of the components that are in DSQL. No locks. There's a lot, right, I mean, it's really, it's very inventive. And then we solved for the end. You know, we solved yeah. for all those components, and and it's uh, it's totally serverless. And so I think that the large scale right. databases in the future will also be well, serverless. Well, serverless actually set the table in those ten year lambda anniversary in the reverter yeah. on that. But as you guys say, that inference is the next building block. I mean, that means something in your world, right? Yeah. I mean, a building block is significant. It's like adding another <laughs> major component. Yeah. What are the implications? Because serverless still ran on servers, right? Databases are bidding where, so I see this as a developer touch point, an application touch point. What are the implications of inference 
as a building block. It's not just a service, it's a, a building block. Can you yeah. share your vision of why as a building block is uh, going to be impactful? Well, I mean, inference really is the implementation of, of uh, models of generative AI, if you think about it. I mean, they're, they're the, you, know, you, you work on these models, you train these models, you try to be able to make predictions, and the actual predictions are the inferences. And so, what it really is another way of saying is that generative AI is going to be a very significant part of every application. And, you know, I, we, we, we talk about generative AI. I, I, in the first year, year and a half of what was happening with generative AI, it was so breathless, and there was so much hand-waving, and we have tried to be as clinical as we can be. You know, we, we knew what we were building. We were building, like we always do, a bunch of primitive building blocks and components that our oh. customers can stitch together to build a great generative AI and, and inference. But we have always felt like we were on this path in AWS to be, I don't know, a couple hundred billion dollar plus annual run rate type of business, and that was before AI. You know, that was before generative AI. Yeah. I think that every single customer experience we know of is going to be reinvented yeah. with generative AI. And then I also think it's going to open up all sorts of opportunities and, yeah. and applications that we just didn't really dream were possible before. Yeah. That's one of the interesting things inside the company, is when you start to see how the models yeah. work and you start to build great experiences, it opens up this explosion of ideas that people just didn't think was possible before. And so, I, you know, to me, the fact that everything's going to be reinvented and, and a lot of things invented for the first time with inference and generative AI yeah. is a huge opportunity for customers to build great customer experiences. And the innovation experimentation creates serendipity. You mentioned being on whiteboards. I mean, this is kind of, we're in this really kind of experimental yeah. breakout moment. Final question, as you come back to AWS, you, the home uh, for you that you built, the house that you built, the OG, the godfather of cloud, What's it feel like, and then what do you hope happens as we document the next wave of cloud growth, changing the world? What's your, well, what's your... uh, first of all, it's great to be back with you guys. I do remember the first time we met in that like dank conference room <laughs> in New York City, yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I felt like you guys got the cloud in a way yeah. that nobody else had at that point, yeah. and I continue to, um, to watch what you guys do and say and think and theorize, yep. you guys are very on it. So you know, so I, I always enjoy spending the time. And uh, you know, I would say also, like I, mean, I appreciate the nice words, but it, as you know, anything that yeah. you that you build that has success, it's a group of people yeah. from the start. So I've been lucky to be part of this team. You know, what I hope for in the next several years is that. Yeah. Um, I mean, remember, as fast as the cloud has grown, yep. it's still about 85 to 90 percent of the worldwide global IT yep. spend is still on premises, yep. which I think is insane. Yep. Yep. And I am very confident that yep. you fast forward 10 to 20 years from now, that equation is going to flip. Yep. So, I, I and it will allow people to get more done for less money, yep. to invent at a faster clip, and to get better productivity from their engineers, which is their yep. service resource. So, one is we hope that we help people make yep. that transformation, and then. When I think about the, the opportunities, this is a golden age in technology. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't have, this is maybe the biggest change, for sure since the cloud, and probably since the internet, with what's available yeah. and, and what the opportunities are in AI. And so, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we make it much more cost effective yeah. for people to be able to train models, um, to be able to do inference and scale. It's part of why people are so excited about training is it's just going to make it much more cost effective to do more with less. Um, I, you know, I would have told you, if you'd asked me 12, 15 months ago where most companies would, would operate, those three layers of the stack we talked about, I would have assumed almost everybody was going to only operate in the middle and leverage existing frontier models. But I really now strongly believe from our own experience that those with technical competence are going to do a lot of their own model building as well. So we're going to try yeah. and make this much easier yeah. for people to do. And then, you know, I, I, we're so early with respect yeah. to what the customer experiences are. I mean, uh, how long have we been talking about autonomous driving? <laughs> right? I mean, I remember talking about this with you 10 years ago, and it's still not here in any broad way, although we're getting close, but there are going to be so many experiences mm -hmm. that are going to be completely different for, for us, for our kids, for our kids' kids, yeah. they're going to, that are going to be great for society, and, yeah. and I'm optimistic that we'll be yeah. underneath a lot of them. I well, appreciate the compute and all the advancements, and that's a renaissance for software, and again, congratulations. Thanks for having us, and great to see the throwback CUBE uh, reunion. 
It's thanks great to coming. be with you guys. Thanks for coming thanks, back. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Andy thanks. Jackson here at the Cube Special Broadcast. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching.